You are now entering the Mix You podcast. No credentials required. Well, hello, everyone. Welcome to episode 24 of the MXU podcast. We are so glad to be back. I'm here with my good friend, Lee Fields, and our good friend, Robert Scovel. Uh, he's joined us today for our um, first podcast in quite a while. So, guys, welcome. I'm so glad you're here. Thanks for joining together as we uh, move forward with a next chapter for MXU. Awesome to be here. Thanks for the invite. Always great to hang with you guys. Thanks for being here, Robert. Appreciate you. Yeah, pleasure, man. Pleasure. And glad we could keep you in the air conditioning. <laughs> yeah, man, it's scorching here today. <laughs> oh. All right. Well, guys, we're here. Yeah, but obviously there's a, a huge hole based on our friend and colleague and partner and brother who's not here. So we just needed to address this right away and didn't want to just make any bones about the fact that our brother Andrew is no longer with us because uh, July 9th, he passed away tragically and suddenly. And so some of you who um, have followed us for a long time have been right with us in figuring out how to process this and just grieve the loss as well as figure out how to kind of fill the void that his influence left um, in your personal development, uh, among your team, um, in your life. You know, some of you were friends of his personally as well. And so I just want to say from the from the get-go, we are with you and know exactly how you feel. And it sucks and we hate it. But here we are, like you, trying to figure out how to move on. And so part of this podcast is to talk about some of that um, and to fill you in on some of what's next for MXU. But um, first and foremost, we just want to thank you for your support of us, for your prayers, for your encouragement, your text, your DMs. It's all been, um, you know, in the midst of a tough season, a really encouraging thing to see how everyone has kind of rallied and responded. So thank you. Uh, yeah, I mean, you, you couldn't have said it better. I still, I, I'm catching myself actually more frequently in the last week or two, like going, dang it. Like, it, you know, it, it doesn't seem real. It seems like I should be getting a text from Andrew or, you know, and so I'm kind of going through that. I think because of the nature of our friendship with him and, and what we do, we've had to wear like multiple hats through this. You know, it's it's a business partner and it, it's a friend. And it, so both of those at the same time, it's like, you know, Jeff and I have had to have business conversations and just figure out what we're going to do and how we're going to move forward. And then you're like, oh, crap, I need to take care of myself and remember that I lost a friend and and how to process all that. And and I catch myself wondering, like, how am I supposed to feel and I said that to a friend of mine and he said, you just need to ride whatever waves in front of you, you know? And so that's been really helpful. And, um, yeah. So, you know, so I, 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 you know, I'm the, the third wheel here to some degree, but you know, I've known Andrew long enough to, to know, I feel very confident in saying this, that he's looking down on you guys. He's looking down on all of us right now and laughing his ass off. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he's just literally up there going, dudes, get over it. Get with it. House lights are going out. Come on, let's go. Come on, you got this. Seriously, let's go. That's great. I guarantee you that's what he's doing. That's you know, such a good encouragement. That's a great word. You're totally right. You're totally right. I mean, has there ever been a more pragmatic guy doing what he's doing? He's like, hey, let's go, you know? Right. Right. That's so true. We actually said... If we didn't keep this thing going, he would kick us square in the nuts. Without question, man. Without <laughs> question. We felt so strongly about that. I told his mom that. <laughs> well, we were at the memorial and I said it to his dad and he said, oh, you're damn right he would. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. I mean, you can't have yeah. known that guy without pulling that perspective. I mean, just no doubt about it. Come on. Yeah. Okay. So here we are. All right, go. What do we do now? I mean, well, do, let's let's carry on. Let's you know. I don't want him laughing at me. I want, I want to actually impress the guy. So let's let's do something right. 
Okay. Okay. So here's what we got. Um, we've established that we're going to keep going and this is, this is chapter two. You know, this is not the, not the ninth inning. It's still the first. So, uh, without sounding opportunistic or, or anything like that, I actually think what I'm about to say will be honoring. Um, this whole thing was started as a conversation between Jeff and Andrew and I, and we think, um, we've been able to build a tribe and people listen to what we say because it's a conversation. We're just going to take that conversation to the next level. And we're going to create conversations, not just between us, but uh, between other people. So we've invited some more friends to join in on the conversation. And Robert, that's why you're here today. You've been a, you've been a part of the conversations uh, since the beginning, but on more more on the sidelines and as a special guest. And we're really going to change the format of what MXU is. And you're going to be hearing from people like Robert more often. You're going to hear from guys like uh, Pooch, Ken Van Druten more often, uh, from Greg Price, from guys like Brad Maddox, Corey Edwards, Adam Taylor, lots of guys that you, you all know. We've been in conversations with them the past few weeks. And the future of MXU will will look different but we actually think it's going to be more impactful and more valuable and a lot more fun too so we're we're really excited about it even though you guys have kind of framed it as you know kind of changing it a little bit to me it's you're just carrying on exactly what you've been doing you know you're just expanding the breadth of the conversation here you know this this is going to be a conversation and you know between engineers about what we do how we do it etc you know you're just adding some fresh voices to this now Nothing could be more impactful. And, and, you know, the the most important thing, I think, to realize this, it, it's going to sound glaringly obvious, but it has to be said, you know, Andrew's influence did not die with him. Th- that is going to carry on for ages here. You know, I mean, he, you know, I mean, I still think about th- things that he and I talk about still to this day, and I will for probably till the day I stop breathing. You know, I mean, that's just part of the deal here. That's part of his gift to this whole thing is that of influence and mentorship, you know, and that, that doesn't leave with him that stays, you know, that's great. Well, and so on that point, I think, you know, we were talking before we actually kind of came online officially recording just about that idea of, you know, not really legacy so much, but just how you, how you sort of prepare the team around you and your, you know, the people that you do have influence over, um, how how you prepare for a world for them to sort of take the mantle and go on. And so, you know, this is a great, it's, it's just a great opportunity to kind of have that discussion because it happens in churches all the time with senior leadership. You know, the senior pastor has been there 30 years and now he has this sort of transition plan and he's going to pass the torch to whoever's next. And so they have this multi-year rollout and there's this smooth thing and sometimes it's not so smooth, but you know, for guys in production world, it's, you know, it's rare that there would be that kind of intentionality and that kind of uh, just purpose behind kind of taking that influence and levering, leveraging it really specifically toward the team around you for the future. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, it, I mean, we do it all the time where you might be preparing somebody to cover for you on a weekend. <laughs> You know, it's a obviously a very, very expanded version of that mindset. You know, somebody's got to cover for Andrew for a lot longer than a weekend now, you know. So, uh, you know, the whole idea is to get somebody there who can, you know, have his kind of vision and also have his kind of passion and then apply their own voice to it and and make it work. You know, that's that's the challenge there with any any time anybody of that magnitude is going to get replaced. You know, you don't want a clone yeah. of Andrew, but you want somebody that has his capabilities and, you know, be able to put their own voice to that and, and move it to the next level. You know, that's always going to be the goal there. Yeah. It's, it's kind of pointless to try and replace someone as with a big, uh, a large personality like that, you know, and his, his fingerprint on everything he did, uh, would leave a deeper embossment than most people's, you know? So it's even for us, like, you know, people have emailed us and asking people actually asked, Hey, can I fill, fill the spot? Which is interesting, but no, it's, <laughs> it, it, you can't because it, it's just forever going to be different, you know? And 
Robert, you mentioned something right before you, you actually lost a, a couple friends this summer in a, in a short period of time. And yeah, it one was, of your friends was, yeah, it was uh, the same month we say. lost Andrew. I mean, you know, a couple of uh, guitar guys that I've toured with, you know, many years in the past, very, very close friends with who were very, you know, held significant positions on tours and with bands, you know, and, you know, it's, again, it's just that thing of nobody's prepared for them to go, but, you know, part of your job as being someone who's in that is to kind of prepare that spot for when you're gone. You know, I mean, you have to do it, you know, uh, it's, it's, you know, it's kind of one of those, it feels morbid to talk about it and to think about it, but you know, that's, that's showing love for the position that you have and how it gets handled when you're in your absence, you know? So it's a tough yeah. subject, but it's, it's an important one. Like I, you know, like I said, not to sound morbid about it. And I'm, you know, I've said this many times in the past, the mortality rate is 100%, you know, <laughs> nobody gets out. So, you know, you have to prepare for it. You just do. I'm, I'm sure there are people wondering, okay, what does that look like? I mean, you know, it's one thing for me to be sort of the audio director or the production director at my church and whether it's a full-time staff position or not, you know, what are some practical things I can do, whether it's in the way that I train my volunteers or in the way that I communicate our strategy or how I cast vision, like what, for the guys who you've seen do it well, what are some sort of best practices that we could all implement to go, you know what, I, because we've talked a lot around here about how we need to be open-handed and we need to not have a tight rein on things and how can we sort of empower the people around us through, you know, what I would call kind of technical discipleship in a way. It's like, how do, okay, if, if mentally I go, okay, I get that. What do we do to actually make that a reality? I sure wish I had the answer to that. I wish I had a great <laughs> answer to it. Um, I, you know, I, I, I guess I think maybe you have to be able, you have to be empathetic a little bit. You have to put yourself in somebody else's shoes that you're going to ask to do that and say, if, you know, if somebody was training me to replace them, you know, what, what kind of things would I demand? What kind of things do I think I need to, to do? You know, what are the hallmarks of what that person did that kept them in that seat for so long? You know, what, what you know, what were the hallmarks of their success? And then how do I, how do I kind of take those? And again, you, you know, you, I think the dangerous part is to say, I need to be them. I need to be another one of them. You don't, you need to take yourself and make your yourself as, as suitable, as successful as they were. You know, I, I mean, you, you're not going to be able to clone yourself into being somebody else. You know, I mean, it's very much like, uh, you know, I, I, not to go off on a tangent here, but you know, even when I'm working in the studio or if I'm working with a band and we're talking about making their record, you know, whatever. It's like, we're here to make your record, not mine, right? I, it's not about me pretending that I'm Mutt Lang. It's about us working together, communicating, and finding the best path to a very successful project here. You know, you kind of need to take that really healthy kind of outlook on the whole situation, you know? Uh, if, you're, if you're mired in, I've got to replace Andrew you know, then boy, you're, you're going to be in for some really hard road coming, you know? So what you guys don't know who are listening is that during Robert's brilliant response to my question, we lost the internet. And so as he was giving his great answer, all, <laughs> all Lee and I heard was, I want to, 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 I want to. So as brilliant as it was, we're convinced that Andrew was actually just punking us by getting into the electrons of the interwebs and just saying, hey, I'll show you guys. Quit talking about me. So here we are. Right. That was just so awesome. So the only next logical thing to do is read some sound complaints. <laughs> I think that's brilliant. So it's time for Turn Down for MXU. Well, Jeff, you got one. I got one. Yes. So I'm stealing this from our favorite Facebook group. And so Nate Graham, if you're listening, you know, you can text your mom and tell her you made her, tell her you made it on the MXU podcast. Um, <laughs> so a lot of you saw this and a lot, well, when I screenshotted it to Lee at that point, there were 220 comments. Um, so it's obviously struck a nice little nerve with a lot of people, but this is on a prayer request card, handwritten in pencil. 
And it looks like it was written, I don't know, by a, f- I don't know, fourth or fifth grader. I mean, it's not the actual age of the person, but it's just the level of penmanship. So there's a place for your name and your phone number. And then it says, fill in space below with your prayer requests. So here it is. First of all, the poster of the of the note says, I am LOLing so hard. My calibrated SPL meter was peaking around 94 dBA fast and averaging about 88 dBA. By the way, my speaking voice in my office peaks around 79. I told all my volunteers that I'd fire them if I ever caught them peaking this low. So here's the, here's the complaint. And I quote, your music is too loud. I used a decibel meter and it averaged 75 dBA with highs of 78 dBA. (laughs) Newer studies show hearing damage to children and infants at levels above 70 dBA. This is for your information, as I felt it my duty to let you know what new research has found. Thank you. (laughs) Um, All of those children and infants who are so damaged, by the way, they're yelling on the playground and crying in their cribs is way louder than 70 dBA. So it's yeah, 70 dBA. I mean, that's, you know, that's gosh, barely that's ambient noise. Exactly. I know consoles that start up louder than that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And the, the picture of his is a, he's, he's on an M seven CL. I don't, I don't even think those get that loud anymore. <laughs> <laughs> only, only when you turn them on. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. Okay, I've got one. It's actually a complaint about video. <laughs> oh, well, like the video it's, it's guys about never time. get complaints. I know. Like who complains about video? So I mean, aside from sound guys, you mean? Right. Okay. That's true. So this screen, this church installed new projection screens. I think because they got four complaints about them in in one weekend. Oh, that's funny. So I'm going to read all four of these. They're short and highly entertaining. All right, the first one. Blank church is not a mega church. Two large screens are not necessary and in fact are distracting and so visually assaulting. I couldn't look up the entire service may not be back. (laughs) Wow. (laughs) Visually assaulting. Yeah. Next, get rid of those screens. The new screens, all caps, do not work for me. Most likely I will give up membership and attend elsewhere after being here since 1995. My goodness. Yeah, saucy. Next, the new screens are too much. A visual assault. The recent orange screens were too much. Now this. Now, I don't... I'm just trying to picture what the recent orange screens were. Orange screens. What's that? What's that got to be referencing? Maybe it's like some kind of motion graphics they were using that were orange. Yeah. My question okay, is, what are, what are they favorite. doing wrong? I mean... What if it was like a 200-seat room and two 35-foot screens? <laughs> <laughs> well, clearly, they'll get some bigger screens at some point. I mean, it's going to be needed in that size room. So. Right, totally. Okay, and then last, this one's amazing. I'm not crazy about the new big screens. Seems to bring us closer to Hollywood, but further from Bethlehem. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but just wait, oh. just wait till you see your grandkids up there during the Christmas play. It's going to be awesome. That'll be awesome. That, that is amazing. Wow. I heard um, a pastor one time, it was Perry Noble, actually, a long time ago when he was at New Spring. He was, he was doing a leadership conference and he's, he started talking about um, older people in church and he's pissed off. And he's like, why is it that your grandparents will do anything for your grandkids except change their music? Yeah. Music. We hold on to it pretty tight. Don't we? I mean, yeah, let's face really it. Do. I mean, I live in an, an entire generation right now. I mean, part of my generation is that generation that thinks all music sucks except for, you know, 1964 to 1978, you know, so, you know, yeah. I mean, it's, that's real, you know, people and, you know, people treat music different. I'm, I'm sorry. They just do, you know, music holds a different place emotionally for people than anything else. 
Totally. It totally does. It does. I mean, we, you know, I said, I was on another podcast here a lot long ago. We were talking about this, you know, where, you know, was it as good as our podcast or is it not as good? Well, <laughs> it's not as good as your previous podcast, but this one, it'll be as good as this one. Oh, that's so, okay. Fun. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I was, I was kind of, you know, kind of implying that, you know, music is one of these kind of weird things where we, we can hold very, very specific times and very specific memories to songs. You know, like I, like I remember that. I remember what I was doing the first time I heard that song, or I remember something I was doing when I was listening to that song. And, you know, there's, there's not really any other mediums that have that. You're like, you don't think about movies that way, you know, maybe yeah. other than, okay, I remember when I was at the drive-in, you know, with Susie during that, you know, movie or whatever, you might tie that, but you think about so many memories that you have that are tied to, to music. I mean, they're very uh, descriptive, very specific memories, you know? So people have a tendency to hold on pretty tight to them, you know? Absolutely. Yeah, they totally do. It's interesting too. Like I'm thinking of like the most prolific songwriters of the last 40 years, you know, the Eagles, Tom Petty, of course. And like, if you listening to that music, it kind of runs all ages. Like, I don't know many people that I could play Hotel California for for the first time and then not think it's a great song. Yeah. yeah. But then if I play a new Coldplay song to someone in their 60s, they may not like it. Yeah. It's yeah, interesting. That's, you know, it's different, though. I mean, you know, new music and I think artists go through this process. I, I've actually remember talking to Tom about this a few times. You know, when you write new music. It takes time to boil. You know, it takes time to get in the consciousness of yeah. the listeners. And, and I think artists, at least the ones I've dealt with, really struggle with that, where they might write a, a new album, you know, a great new album, and think, oh, my fans are going to love this. And get to the shows, put the new songs in the set, and they're just sleepers during the set. Yeah. You know, I mean, the crowd's just gone, oh, he's playing stuff from the new record. Fast forward three or four tours. Now those songs carry all the same excitement. You know, once they've had some time to sit and brew and people have had maybe time to associate memories with them or, you know, other things, That's then there's excitement point. built at the event. But man, when it's brand new, I mean, unless it's, you know, an absolute hit song that everybody can't wait to hear, you know, that's obviously a little different thing. But, you know, if it's a, you know, mid-level album track or whatever, you, you know, you think it's the best thing you've ever written in your life. But get out and play it you know, right after free falling, and everybody's like, "Oh yeah, whatever." You know? Right, right. Exactly. And I'm, I'm sure for an artist of that magnitude, it's exponentially worse because you've got certain songs that are literal cultural, yeah, like mile markers. You know, every American knows this song or that song or whatever. So you get out there and you try something new, and it's even harder probably for that to get any traction. Oh, totally. You well, know, I mean, you know, American Girl is one of those songs. Yeah. You know, I mean, you know, <laughs> you could, I mean, you know, it, this is going to be a complete exaggeration, but, you know, he could probably go out and play the entire new album and end with American Girl and everybody go home happy, you know? Right. <laughs> yeah. Gosh, that's such a good point. Well, my wife and I went um, early last spring to the Eagles in Atlanta, and I was just floored by i mean it was from so that the show opened with um acapella blackout <laughs> seven bridges road there are stars in the southern yeah. sky and yeah. from that moment until the very end of the very last note of the night everyone in the room was singing every word to every single song sure, sure. i mean it was just you don't even remember how you know these songs and yet they're just a part of you and i was just I was so taken with that, just how much of a phenomenon that is. And you must have seen that every night in, oh, in a lot a of doubt. ways. I yeah. mean, you, uh, it's clear that some songs are just, you know, it sounds, again, it sounds exaggerated to say it, but they are the soundtrack to your life. You know, they are. And, and you know, especially now that we watch movies and they use that music as the soundtrack for the movie. You know, you start relating things like that in your life where you have an episode that happens in your life and you think, and, you know, maybe a song comes into your mind while it's happening. You know, I mean, just all of that kind of thing glues it all together. That's what makes that concert experience so, so great. And it's, I mean, not for nothing. That's why I believe live music will always be the centerpiece 
It'll always be the centerpiece of the culture. You know, you can't take that away. You can't replace it. It'll never, you know, we can't just watch it in, you know, virtual reality and, or watch it in a movie theater or watch concerts on TV. You're never going to have that experience. And I, I hope we never lose sight of it because that, that connective, that connective tissue that happens at a concert, you know, in front of a really, you know, great live band, man, there's nothing like that when, yeah. it's, when it's, when it's working, there is that, nothing like that. That shared experience. Oh yeah. You know, everybody walks away with, you know, and, and that makes a new memory that's even totally em- embedding totally. the same music in a, in a different way. So <laughs> I, I'll give you one little side story to that. This, this happened in our house the other day. So, you know, my son is, my youngest son is playing drums now and he has a lot of guys come over and they, they jam. And, you know, I started recognizing some of the songs after a while. I was like, wow, okay. It's playing a little Pink Floyd there. That's cool. Oh, wow. They're doing Rush. Oh, that's, that's good. My wife gets on the text because son has the phone in there so we can tell him, you know, hey, you got to hold off for a minute or whatever. She, she writes in Freebird. Freebird! Oh, that's so, that's so Freebird. funny. <laughs> so he didn't get the reference at all. Uh, the next time they come in, what do I hear in there? They're working on Freebird. He's got it, you know. <laughs> so, that's hilarious. That is so cool. So I started, I, I pulled him aside. I said, hey, here's, here's a good story for you. Go, go ask grandma about this. Grandma took me to see one of my very first concerts. It was Leonard Skinner right when Freebird broke. They were opening for The Who. Go ask her how the show was. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. <laughs> so it's got him all dialed in now. You know, I said, you got to be ready, man. You never know when people are going to call out Freebird. You know, you got to be ready to play that in your set. I mean, that's the measure of any band right there. Come on. Right. <laughs> I've thought about this before, and I've talked about this with some friends, though. It's, it's hard to imagine 50 years from now, all of American culture rallying around X song that's come out this year. I mean, I, it's, I, I don't know that that may just be me being a curmudgeon and going kids today, it is. but it is. do you, you really think that, I mean, is there, yeah, I do. So I do those, those touch points are still going to happen. I still see it happen. I, I, you know, I see it happen now, even when I, and I, this is not meant to sound like I'm bagging on these bands or anything. But, you know, there would have been a point in my life where I would just been like, really, you're going to grow up and, and that poison song is going to be your thing. That's going to be your jam that you just kind of go, that you relate your childhood to. And of course it is because mm-hmm. it happened during, during those, those formative years, years yeah, you know? That's, so, that's good you know, you talked about the Coldplay thing, you know, is, you know, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Well, that record is going to be really, really important to somebody someday. That's I, true. Count on it. Count on Me. it. Me. <laughs> well, me too. Well, yeah. me too. But does that hold the same reverence in my mind as who's next? Well, no, because they happen at different points in my life, you know. But man, that 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 is real. That connectivity is real there. And you know, again, not to sound morbid, you go out far enough on the timeline, and there are people that don't know who the Beatles are. Okay, so get over it. Right. Get over it. So this is the part where I ask, who's the artist behind who's next? <laughs> no it's not no it's not no you, you, that's that question is not allowed please edit that out that's not allowed. i don't know I, I think we're you're experiencing what you're talking about in real time yeah here. we are that's that would be a record by the who and with you know classics as don't get fooled again things like that you, you've heard of the who right you have heard of them okay i gotta be real honest when they did the super bowl a few years ago oh boy this is gonna crush me it is going to crush you, but now I'm, we're, we're here. It's happening. <laughs> I, I knew some of the songs. Mm. Oh, kill me now. Kill yeah, me I now. knew who they were. I, I, you know, it wasn't like a who's this, because I mean, I'm into music, but for some reason, their influence had escaped me. Yeah. yeah. Because there are other bands in that era uh, who that is not true of the Beatles. I mean, that was before that, but. Led Zeppelin, no, lots of Led Zeppelin. Man, uh, look at that time. I have got to be going. I have. I'm going to have to pull away, <laughs> fellas, and just let you guys finish this off. Uh, finish your clearly, lives. Clearly, I've me. got to go die of old age here very quickly. So, <laughs> oh my gosh. See, and you know, I, honestly, I I swear to you, as I'm sitting here, you know, I, I, you and I have talked. We 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 know each other yeah. pretty well. Yeah. That is unfathomable to me. 
It's not fathomable yeah. to me. I, I couldn't even process that. Right. Right. I mean, they were that, that big of a thing, you know, certainly in my childhood. I mean, I was 10 years old when who's next came out. I, I've been, mean, again, I'll relate the story. I was taking drum lessons at the time up to that point. You know, we were learning Ginger Baker, you know, blah, 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 some jazz stuff, you know, all these things. My drum teacher walks in one day with who's next and he goes, well, the whole game has changed. Uh, the drums are sitting at the front of the stage taking all the solos now. So we're going to start working on this record. <laughs> you know, <laughs> He's wow. like, the whole game is different right now. You That's know, amazing. Know, that kind of thing. So, you know, so again, that, that, that record holds a very, very special place for me. You know, it, it changed my whole outlook on you know, musicianship, production, you know, everything, everything. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to go download it right now. Yeah. I had this experience recently with uh, one of our students at the church and he didn't know who the police was. Right. That would be a good one. That'd be a So one. like for me, you know, synchronicity, what year did that come out? 84, 5, It'd be 83 ish. Okay. So I was born in 84, but I know that record like the back of my hand. Okay, did you just say you were born in 84? <laughs> yeah. Does that make you not as pissed off that I didn't know what who's next? Is? Yeah, pretty much. Pretty much. So okay. Given that it was 14 years old at that point. Yeah, okay. I'll, I'll, I'll give you a pass on that one. Okay, that's good. <laughs> but your response to your oh. student, though, Lee, was, okay, you've got homework tonight. You need to go and listen to this record and, yeah. you know, dive in and get to the bottom of what makes it awesome. You know, okay. so similarly, I think, you know, and that's, to me, that's why listening to music is such an important exercise. You know, we talk a lot around here about, you know, always listening to varied, new, unusual, familiar, any kind of music. It's just, it's going to make your pursuit of becoming a better mixer so much better because right. just exposure and trying to dig into what is it about this song that made it a hit or what is it about this sound of this vocal or this snare drum or this bass guitar that makes it this iconic thing in people's minds. And not that we can unlock all of the emotion because, you know, like you said, Robert, there are those touch points where, oh, I remember I was in high school under the bleachers with Susie, what's her name? And this song was the song. That, yeah, that was our song. Yeah, yeah we're not going to touch that. But there's something about the song that made it play at the dance in the first place. And so, you know, if we can unlock some of that, I think that really helps us kind of. Well, I mean, my middle son's a great example of it because he is into rap. I mean, he is into hardcore rap and knows the history of it. Like he can go back in history and talk about artists that were around and prevalent way before he was born, but that's what trips his trigger. I mean, he's got it. And so, you know, that, that kind of shared experience thing, that's going to be his 30 years from now, he's going to look back on that time and kind of go, oh, yeah, Snoop and, you know, blah, blah, blah. And, and you know, the, the weird part of it is, you know, it's all I, I kind of asked this question not long ago when the 50th anniversary of Woodstock was happening. I was I had kind of back, gone back and re-explored a bunch of records and stuff that I had from that era, including Woodstock. And I kind of posed the question, well, OK, you know, I, if I look back on in history to that period when I, you know, I was alive during that period, I remember it very, very well. You know, and if somebody asked me, well, identify the counterculture then, because that was the counterculture. Identify who they were and, and what they were all about. I could easily do that. I could give you multiple examples of the collective counterculture. But I kind of asked the question, who's the counterculture today? Who is it yeah, that is right. gonna that that music is gonna be the the fertilizer for the counterculture? You know, because at some point the counterculture becomes the culture. Right. And it's no longer the counterculture, you know? I mean, you know, we saw grunge go through that. We've seen punk go through that. We've seen rap go through that now. You know, it's it's this ever, ever evolving thing, you know? And that concept of angst that is fueled by that music, that's always going to be with us. It's always going to yeah. be with us. And it's this important. Reminds it's me. really important. Well, know? that's rock and roll from the beginning, right? I mean, that, it that is. was the whole deal. It's funny, yeah. though. I remember that post of yours, and I was surprised by the number of people who resisted the idea that there even was one anymore. Yeah. Or well, that, I, I even said the fact that I have to ask that question may, may self answer it, you know? Yeah. I mean, that may tell you more than you need to know there, you know, cause we, you know, it's like, you know, in the sixties it was, you know, 
the kids, the youth against the establishment, right? Today, yeah. it's kind of the establishment is fighting the establishment. You know, there's not even a, you know, right. is, the, is the culture even involved in it? We're just kind of sitting back and watching it all happen now, you know, while watching it all unfold. It's very, it's a very disorienting time, you know. Yeah, like when was the last Nirvana? Right, right. Were they the last ones? Well, I, I happen, I, I like to believe it's all going to, it's cyclical. You know, it comes back around at times. So we'll see. We'll see. Okay. Speaking of live music. Uh, I've been thinking about something a lot since Chicago, Robert. Okay. I've been working on something pretty hard. Have Robert, you now? Have you now? Have. Been working on your free throws? That's good. Uh, That's good. Something <laughs> like that. <laughs> it's the drum room emulation that you're doing. Yeah. That thing just worked my brain over <laughs> a whole lot. But I have attempted it in a much simpler form, maybe. And I don't mean simpler as in better, just so that I could attempt it. Yeah. And I think I understand what you're talking about now. Yeah. yeah. Because So for people who missed it, why don't you just review a little bit of what, what we're talking about here? Yeah. So you have multiple ways of getting the drum kit to sound like what it was recorded. Is that an accurate way to say that? Like on the album. So like room mics the whole picture of the kit like talk about that well i i think ultimately that is grounded in there are ways that you go about getting a drum sound you know like yeah. if you go back through the history of even rock music let's take it from the you know the 60s all the way out you know that sound is not just captured with a close mic on the snare drum and some equalizing and sending it to a reverb that's not how those sounds were captured. And, right. you know, to kind of, and that's always been this kind of approach that I've watched take place in live sound where it's like, and, and you know, I'll, I'll say, I, you know, maybe it's because guys that are mixing live sound at the level that I was looking at didn't come from the studio. So they didn't have that kind of audio imprint on their brain to begin with of saying, this is what I've got to get it to sound like. And this is how I do it. I mean, maybe they're just, you know, okay, I'm going to brighten up the snare and send it to a reverb, send it to a plate, and that's going to be my drum sound. You know, that's that's not the way those records or those drum sounds were created, you know. And and I think people are always shocked when I unfold it for people at how much, how little close miking is actually used, especially in drum sounds, you know. The close mics are right. very rarely the prevalent microphone in the mix. It's the distant miking that is the prevalent microphones in a drum mix, you know? And, you know, that, that really warps some people's thinking, especially when they come to live sound. It's like, well, we have no choice but to do that here. You know, it's like, no, you do have some choices. Right, right. You do have some choices. You just got to, got to think it through here. And, and I, you know, look, I'd love to tell you that I had it figured out in the first week. It took me years of trying that and trying it and trying to find some things that, that I thought were suitable replicas of, you know, that kind of distant miking and drum sound. And with, in all fairness, I mean, the Tom Petty records probably drove me to do it more than anything, because if you listen to everything past full moon fever, I mean, the drum sounds don't sound like drums, you know, up until right. probably wildflowers where they kind of went backwards and a little, went a little more retro. But up until that point, I mean, you know, I mean, it's room sounds. I mean, it's, it's a room. Yeah. It, it that is a room mic. I mean, the snare drum that sounds nothing like a snare drum. I mean, it sounds like noise, you know. So, how do you kind of honor that and you know give that kind of vibe in the show? It took me a long time to figure out how to do it uh, credibly, and certainly I, yeah, I did it a lot more credible with digital consoles than I ever did it with analog, believe it or not. So, because uh, you have a lot more choices in terms of how you spatialize things and and process it. So. Yeah, don't glaze over that last sentence that quickly because I think that's where seeing you do it on a digital console and the different ways you're doing it with saturation and compression and reverbs. And there's lots of stuff going on to do that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's really kind of rooted in, and again, if you get in the studio and you see how it's done, it becomes like, Oh, wow, that's, I could do that live. And it, you know, it's really taking a room sound, you know, into a good set of pre's saturating a little bit, limiting it really hard, you know, creating all that harmonic, Yep. plume out of it and putting it right in your drum mix and let it be prevalent. You know, 
it's yeah when you see it and and like when you're sitting at the console in the studio and you hear it kind of glue together you just go wow that's just awesome right there you know you don't i just don't you know i i don't fight that hardly anymore in certainly with digital consoles and live sound I, you know i've kind of got templates set up where it's like okay i can go for a really roomy thing here or kind of boomy roomy or bright fat you know i you know i, I can get around it and kind of map it really quickly now you know so it's a lot of fun. It makes, makes, and you know, you know, this Lee, both you guys know this from doing this, you know, once you get that foundation built in your mix, right. Then all the rest of it just seems to fall into place. You know, once you get that drum sound, right. And that bass guitar sound, right. It just makes the rest of it so much easier to glue together. You know, if you don't have that, that foundation sorted out, and it's probably why we spend so much time on drums, but uh, you know, it's worthy. It's worthy of it because it's such an important aspect to the, to what people are going to hear. Okay. So let me tell you the simple way that I'm trying to emulate what I heard you do in Chicago and you just give me some feedback and then you'll hear this in Anaheim. I'll play it for you. Cool. Looking forward to it. Uh, so I just took the overheads and made sure they were in a good spot. First of all, just miking up the whole kit, not too close to the cymbals. Yeah. Like actually trying to mic the kit, not just overheads. Yeah. Yeah. And then... I did a separate send for this and I'm just calling it like a room and I did it variable. So it's not like a group and then just queued up that send and tried to mix like the kick and the rest of the kit into it as if I was listening to room mics in the back of the studio. Exactly. Because if you just send everything to it, like the kick and snare were just like too loud and the maybe symbols even got too loud. So yeah. it was a, it was a balance between, where to put those mics and then how much of the rest of the kit to send until it sounded like well, what would two condensers in the back of a drum room sound like? Yeah. And then put a room reverb on that and then just played with the mix yeah. until it sounded right. Yeah. I mean, and, you know, I mean that this. is essentially how I do it. You know, I, I mean, people have asked me, you know, why did you go to that extra overhead? Like, you know, I do the stereo set, you know, the, yeah. the wide set, but I also put one up kind of high. That is a, an XY mic. And that is the primary mic that I deal with in terms of room and drum kit sound, you know? And it, yeah, it's almost okay. like, you know, if you were in the studio, that mic that is over the kit would be sitting about 10 feet in front of it. Like, right. I, I can't do that in a show, so let's put it up over the kit and, you know, kind of, it, it, it's trade-off there, but, you know, let's, I bet it's going to come out really close to the same, you know? And especially if I blend the close mics back to that, into that room, and, and like you said, try to create this room presence, you know, for the kit that adds in with it. I mean, it, it just adds a level of reality to that drum kit and production quality of that drum kit that you can't get with just, just using close mics, you know? Yeah. So then I got an EQ on the send, which yes. I saw you do it. And I don't know why I ever thought of e not EQing sends like a, brilliant even with vocal verbs like that's a game changer well we you know we never had the ability to do it before in analog i don't even know what that is either so that doesn't matter i'm just <laughs> i've just been skipping that the whole time you remember analog consoles don't you we, okay never mind yeah maybe and then like you said compress and limit after the room sound and yeah. now where i think we're different and this would be the advanced level now i'm just feathering that room sound into my closed mic mix yeah so I think you're probably going like that's the core and then putting the close mics in on top of that. Well, I have it where I can, where I can easily weight it one way or the other. Cause I, I'll okay. use Petty as the example, cause it's the easiest thing to, to recall and reference. There are times like there are certain Petty eras that when there are certain songs in play where it's weighted way more toward the close mics. And then yeah. there are other eras where it's weighted way more toward the ambience. So I, you know, I've just got it set up where I can balance those things very quickly uh okay that's you know, awesome well i'm looking forward to you hearing my attempt at this yeah i think the biggest probably i don't want to call it a mistake because you know it's all relative but i when i've kind of shown this to other people and then watch them put it together and try to use it almost to a man they all go for room sounds or reverb sounds that are too big too long you know it's like the, you yeah. can get away with this being really short like really right. short it is meant there just for coloration, you know, and uh, kind of excitement on that kit, you know. So, you you know, people are always shocked how, how, you know, toned down I've got the rooms. And, you know, one of the funniest ones is, you know, I, I've had a couple guys come up to me and just go, dude, what's, what is going on 
on that kick and snare right now, you know, and I will show them this little process, but it's just the simple little D verb, you know, it, it, the simplest reverb in the world, you know, and let's go, that's what yeah. you're using. And it's like, yes, but if you just <laughs> use it in this really particular way, I mean, it works absolutely fantastic, you know? Because it's really so, not about the reverb at all. The reverb is just another color of the overall sound of the room that you're going for. So Yeah, and, and I think so much of this is rooted in this thing that is not n- paid nearly enough respect in our world. Recording guys get this almost, you know, infinitely. But live sound guys have a tendency, ironically, not to get this, is that, you know, even something that is close mic'd for the, for the most part, has some room presence in it. You know, when that amplifier or that drum is sitting in a room, even if we close mic it, that room is having an impact on the sound of that instrument, you know, and it is in there to some degree. It's a much lower degree. The ratio of it is very low, for instance, but the sound of the instrument in that room is changed depending upon the room, right? That's why you can walk into some room and get a great vocal sound, even though I'm right on the microphone right now, go to another room and all of a sudden, I'm using the same mic, same pre, everything. But why isn't the track, why isn't the vocal track sitting in the mix now? What's happening? What's happening here? You know, it's the room that it's in. It's in there. It has, it plays to it, you know. Okay, so Jeff, got a surprise for you. Okay. <laughs> Uh-oh. So you're mixing for Lauren Daigle right now. And you're traveling with Digico's, but next week you have to use a PM7? Have to or get to, but yes, I'll be using a PM7 next week. Nice. And I sent you a template file for that. You did. And this room mic is in that file. Oh, for <laughs> excellent. Well, I'm going to, I've got a little project to work on. That's going to be awesome. I like yeah. it. I so, like it. so have fun with that. Well, and the great thing about this particular band is that Paul Mabry is the drummer and his approach to the kit suits this just perfectly because yeah. we've already got sort of what we call kind of you know snare rim is what he calls it but basically it's a it's a mic that's just sort of out in front of the kit that really uh-huh. is just a kind of a whole kit mic it's a mono channel but it really does give an incredible picture of what the kick and snare are doing with everything else and so i've yeah. i've been kind of feathering that in with all the close mics and it really it's really cool but then to add this other component of you know because I've, I've been doing a lot of compression and processing with that with that mic but then to have this extra bus and extra extra idea especially with the reverb dialed in that'll be even better so that's great but you know the magic in all of this though is is having a drummer who can play in balance you know, if, if he's totally. very snare heavy or he's very cymbal heavy in his mix, like if you're just standing listening to him play and it sounds really out of balance, you know, then then it gets exaggerated just like it would in the studio. That gets exaggerated and you have to kind of reverse engineer it, reverse mix it to get it to rebalance. You know, that's when it gets really, really tough. So, I mean, luckily for me, you know, all the years that I've been working on this, I've been I've worked with some incredible drummers who just you could put up one microphone on the dang kit and, and probably get a great drum mix. You know, I mean, seriously, that's, that's not exaggeration. You know, you can make that happen. Well, you know, it's funny, this, this kind of sound that we're talking about, you know, when I think about that sonic imprint, to me, it's, it's you know, in large part due to those Zeppelin records. And it's that, that drum room sound really is that feeling of there's just a mic above the kit and you're mm-hmm. just hearing him bang away at these drums in a beautiful, incredible way. So, you know, that, it's funny that you said that because it really is like put up a mic and with a great drummer, it's, it's just going to work. It's magic. But you know, I, I'll even submit this to you in those recordings. The room is the star. Oh, totally. Not the microphones, not the drum kit, et cetera. You know, with it, the room is really what they're showing you there. Yeah. Now that said, you know, I've done the, you know, the four miking thing, you know, uh, you know, over the kit, you know, there's a lot of stuff on the online talking about how Glenn Johns did that. And um, I've done that. I've actually used it live, believe it or not, uh, to great effect. But I will say this about it. There are specific microphones that it works exceptionally well with and ones that it doesn't work great with. And even the, even the times I've tried it in the studio, if you're using, you know, U67s to do it, it's just magic. It's just magic. 
I mean, you just kind of sit in front of the speakers and go, how is that so good right now? <laughs> you know, but yet, you know, if you try it with other microphones, et cetera, it doesn't, doesn't quite work the same way. So, you know, there is something to be said for the microphones, but, you know, ultimately the room is the thing there. The room and the, the mix that the drummer actually plays, those are the stars of the thing. You're just trying to capture it, you know. And by the way, I do know who John Bonham is. No, you don't. You just <laughs> looked it up on the internet, didn't you? No, I didn't. You, no, you just looked it up. Come on. <laughs> okay, I have a question for you, Robert. So next week, I'm mixing um, a gospel band in an arena, and the kit is large. Like, and on the like input lots list, of inputs? Lots of inputs. Yeah. Lots of toms, lots of cymbals. They've got on their input list three overheads, a left, center, right. Okay. How would you approach that? Um, well, it, it begs the question, are they drum mics or are they cymbal mics? That's the first thing. Um, yeah. And my approach is different depending on that answer. So if they are drum mics, and you guys, you guys know me, I'm kind of a precision nut, you know, then I've got to make sure that those microphones are all in phase. And, and yeah. usually in that situation, I'm very concerned about the snare drum arrival time to all of those microphones. So I'll, if time permitting, time permitting, I'll use an FFT to set up and place those microphones and get them all really, really in phase, you know, easily out to 10, 12 K uh, where the snare drum is arriving at each one of those microphones at exactly the same time. Okay, cool. I was thinking of just bringing a couple of my uh, carbon arrows and just touching the snare drum and to the microphone until the, until the fletching of the arrow hit. Well, I mean, you, you can certainly, you're certainly welcome to live with the belief that that's getting them in phase. Um, you know, if you want to live that way, you, you can. Uh, <laughs> okay. Just kidding. I was just wondering about the center mic. Like I've never, they would probably, if I said, Hey, let's just do two mics that they're not going to push back. But then I thought, is there a point where the kit gets so big, you would need three mics? Uh, if those, if those two, you know, the two quote unquote stereo mics are really, really wide, then I would say, yeah, if the Tom sound is part of the overhead miking scheme, then yes, possibly. Gotcha. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Uh, Jeff, have you ever mixed a kit that big with three overheads? Yeah. I mean, I ended up, I, I only did two when I was mixing Neil, but. Uh, that's a big kit. That's a big kit. And he's a big guy and, you know. But I I never felt the need for a, a third overhead there. I actually had it at my disposal if I wanted to use it because there was a kit on the backside of the riser. You know, he would spin around and play a smaller kit. So I had a stereo overhead over that kit that could have been used as a center uh, for the front two. But I just never really felt the need to do that. And I didn't have the capability at that time to to get it all aligned properly. So, you know, I, I swear to you, as I sit here, I, I promise you this is true. You know, if I went into that situation and I knew I wasn't going to have time to get that thing properly aligned, I would put yeah. up one microphone over the center of that drum kit. Yeah. Because, you know, what does stereo mean in life? Right. Setting? I mean, you know, I'm kind of on this crusade right now, you know, where we're doing a lot of discussion now about immersive and, you know, how that's going to play into live sound. I mean, you know, it, it, yeah. we, you know, really one of the things it's starting to do is to reveal to everybody, even though guys that have been doing a long time now, you know, kind of get this implicitly, whether they want to recognize it or not, how bad stereo is for live sound, especially large scale live sound, where you got some large offset between the left and right arrays. You know, it is far, far from desirable uh, for good response for the entire audience. It's just not a great choice, you know? Yeah. There's like eight people getting stereo in an arena. Well, you know, it's not so much that, you know, I, I think, what immersive has shown us, and it certainly kind of plays into my thing of doing LCR for so long, because I, you know, I had this similar mindset. The thing you have to remember about stereo in big live sound, and and I'll, you know, even houses of worship, you know, three thousand seats, two thousand seats, that kind of performance size suffers from this, where everything that is in the center of that stereo mix, right, is being created by a phantom image. It's being, cre being created by an equal arrival time between the two sides, right? That's how that center positioning is happening. So as soon as you start to go off one side or the other, now you've got an intelligibility problem, right? I mean, now you've got cancellation right. that's going to be created. The minute you walk off dead center, it's just a matter of degrees, right, of how far you get off. So, you know, in, in a control room, I mean, what's going to be the offset? A few inches, you know, maybe a right. foot, 
no big deal. I mean, you're, you're not going to suffer from that. But if you're talking in large scale sound reform, I mean, you're talking like in a hockey arena. Now you're right. talking cancellations uh, across the entire band frequency band of the music. I mean, it's really noticeable. The place where I always picked up on it and it's really noticeable in arenas is if you go like, you know, if you just look at a traditional show that is doing stereo out into basketball arena slash hockey arena, the place where yeah. the cancellation is the most pronounced is in the corners of that arena. And everybody always wants to put it down to, oh, it's, you know, lobing, you know, blah, blah, blah. It's not. It's that you're listening to one array on the left side of the room. And then much, much later, you have the right array coming over there as well. And it's canceling all the way down into the bass room and the bass guitar range. That's what's happening there, you know? Yeah, totally. It's like even sitting in church with my wife. If I'm sitting on the far left side of the room yeah. and the PA is 25 feet from me, but the speaker is another 25 feet further right. Yeah. It's just disorienting to be looking at him and hearing him from a completely different place. Right. It drives me crazy. Right. Yeah. It, it, the, it, my brain does not compute that. I, I have such a hard time with that. I, I mean, you guys know from me doing my shows and talking about this for so long, you know, I think localization is the most important piece of it when watching someone play or perform or speak. It's just the most important piece of it. And I think immersive is going to prove that to us because at risk of going really down into the rabbit hole here. You know, when we trade stereo for front field immersive, let's say, what we're trading is mix impulse for, you know, individual impulse. Meaning, you know, yeah. any any instrument I ever hear, regardless of where I am in the room, is only going to come from one source. Right. Right. It's not going to come from two sources. So the intelligibility of it, the localization of it is going to be absolutely fantastic. But we have these large propagation differences now, right? So now I, if I'm on one side of the room, well, I'm good. And the guitar is over there. Well, I'm going to hear the guitar and I'm going to hear the drums, but they're going to be a little out of time now because they're not coming from the same speaker source. You follow me there? Yeah, yeah. totally. So I'm going to trade a little bit of mix impulse there, but I think our brains are going to forgive that. I think our brains are going to be much more forgiving of that than they are of the intelligibility problem or the, the localization problem. You know, I think... You know, if you can localize that audio to what you're seeing, all of a sudden you're going to, your brain is going to add that together really well. Where today, I mean, that's, that's different depending on where you're sitting in the venue with stereo, with stereo, you know, interesting totally. times coming. We got some really, really interesting times coming with PA development guys. It is. I'm excited to see and curious how, how this all goes. Jeff and I are going to be going out to see our German friends in Asheville, North Carolina and playing around on their system and yeah. just see what that means for a house of worship. I, so that'll be, I think it's the, I think it's the silver bullet for house of worship. I really, yeah. I really do. I think it's going to change the whole game there and improve it about a thousand fold. Honestly, the engagement is just going to be so much better, so much better there. And, and I'll just tell this you is this price is well, yeah, of course, you know, but you know, there's, there's interesting things in play there. I, you know, it, it, unquestionably, if we start moving toward immersive, you know, this, it, it, just like it's done in the past, it's going to drive uh, PA design to be different. You know, we've, been, we've always been kind of working toward this narrower, more in control thing. Well, it's going to have to go wider for immersive. We're going to need wider coverage from a, a single stack of PA system in immersive. So, you know, it's going to drive that. It's going to take a little bit of time to get it acclimated. But I'll, I'll tell you this as I sit here. I, I have no problem saying this with a straight face. Once you've mixed in a large format on immersive, versus stereo you just go i i don't want to ever do this any different i i i'm so out of stereo right now it's not even funny now there there are some very disruptive things that are going to happen at the console level because of it right right where we're not mixing to a, a stereo bus anymore there is no mix right. bus anymore the pa is the mix bus right yeah so our whole concepts of grouping and parallel compressions and all that are going to have to shift and morph uh, to account for this, you know, but, uh, I, you know, just the acoustic response of it, the response of the audio coming out of the speaker system. Oh my gosh. I'm just like, please sign me up right now. I, I don't want to ever go back to what we were doing before. That's awesome. Well, I think that's a good note to wrap on. Well, this has been great as usual, Robert, it's just such a pleasure to have you here and be a part of our conversation. And it's just, as we move forward, um, you know, it's, it's guys like you, who are going to make this 
uh, just continue to be so worthwhile for people to stay engaged. And I just love your wisdom and your, your heart for what we're trying to do and how we're all just trying to get better. So thank you for being with us today. Well, let, let me just ask this question. I, and I, I appreciate that sentiment so much. Thank you. It's, it's always an honor to be hanging with you guys. How do we pull off doing the podcast while we're fly fishing? Well, there are these little portable Zoom recorders. Right, right. Yeah, so I I think that's a, a no-brainer. I'll take a generator on that float boat. I don't <laughs> care. Oh, it's <laughs> listen, we've talked about it already. It's 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 going to happen. It's got You got to do that. I mean, you got to do that. Come on. We we've got to have a a mix you podcast while we're hip deep in the water. Come on, that's got to happen. I can arrange this. Yeah. Not only in the water, but around the fire and around the table and around some beverages and all of that. It's like, yes, yeah, yes. This, this now needs to we're talking. Yeah. Forget this internet crap. Yeah. It's, it's not working anyway. We don't, yeah, it's not going to work out. That's awesome. Well, thanks everybody for joining us. Um, be on the lookout. It makes you live tickets for Anaheim on January 22nd, 2020 will be available soon. We have new content being added to MXU now, uh, individual subscriptions and subscriptions for your team. Be sure to check that out on our website. All that can be found at mxu.rocks. Um, anything else, Jeff? I think that's it for now, but we're just excited for what's next and can't wait for you guys to see what's coming. I'll see you guys right, in we'll Anaheim. See. I mean, bring your hip waders. I'm, I'm going to mix with my hip waders on the Anaheim just for practice. Okay. Robert, there is an outdoor archery park in uh, Fountain Valley near the convention center. So bring my bow. That's what that's bring, that's what I'm taking from that. That's what I'm saying. Bring your bow, okay. and we'll go <laughs> buy one at Toys R Us for Jeff. <laughs> that sounds great. Thanks, guys. All right, see you guys. All later. right, man. See you guys later. Bye bye.